Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. He's running for mayor of Baltimore. Yes, indeed. Carl Michael Kennedy. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. First of all, you got the illest name because <laughs> it's Carl Michael Stokey Kennedy, right? Right. right. Well, wait, I'm... well, my mom, she named me after the uh, black nationalist, Stokey, Stokey Carl Michael. Michael. Yeah. And she gave me her last name and just switched it around and gave me a nickname. And I'm going to give me his first name. Is his, my first name was his last name, and his first name was my nickname, and she gave me her last name. So wow. she knew what she was doing. Hopefully, right. <laughs> Hopefully. she was like, "We have plans for you." <laughs> right now, now, what's the story behind Carmichael Stokey Kennedy? I know that you was incarcerated for twelve years. Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, born and raised in, in West Baltimore in poverty, made some poor decisions early on in life, you know, and sort of told me while I was in prison, you know, changed my thinking. And wanted to bring back a, a different uh, culture to Baltimore. You know, I, I messed some things up, so I wanted to fix it. You know, and right now we're in a crisis mode. We're in chaos. You know, uh, my friend over there, we did some uh, business together with Mark Whitten before me and you. Was, you know, and I met you in the summertime. But you know, the Taraji Henson thing. So mm -hmm. I'm always trying to give back and use philanthropy as a, a, a stepping stone for me to change lives and encourage guys like myself who've been through some hardships that you can be more than what your past is. So. Oh. Are people forgiven though? Or are they are they forgiven of what I you've mean, done? It depends I mean, a lot of people like to look at your past and be like, "Oh, you was that," but a right. lot of times people don't understand that you you evolve and you change. Right. It, it depends on who you talk to. You know, a lot of people will never forgive. You know, um, and and that's life. You know, me, I I, I don't walk backwards. I walk forward. You know, what God got for me is for me. You know, I try to surround myself with good people. You know, and hopefully, you know, the good outweigh the bad. You know, the last ten years I've been doing everything I supposed to been doing, paying taxes. You know reading great books, you know, like my friend to my right, you know, and learning from winning. So I can't worry about the negativity because if I do, I mean, I'm kind of stuck. You started selling drugs at age 10. Yeah. My I think a lot of people don't understand how that can happen. Right. Well, you know, one day my father, who I call him a pop dad, he would pop up every six, seven months, sometimes <laughs> years, you know what I'm saying? And one day I was so happy to see him, he asked me to have a seat on the step and he gave me this brown paper bag, you know, and, and 10 years old, I mean, I'm not being rebellious, you know, or defiant against my dad because I'm so happy to see him. And he gave me this bag, and then he like, well, when somebody come over, I say one, two, you give him one, two. And, you know, for like an hour, you know, I'm just giving people packages out the bag, you know. And by the end of the day, I think he might make like $50,000 or something. And he walked away and he gave me $20, you know. And when I look back on it, you know, that was, you know, my introduction to the life of crime. You know, and as... I mean, it's problematic as it is, you know, it was, it was a real story. You know, for me to actually have to be exposed to crime by my biological father. So, you know, and, you know, I, you forgive people along the way, but I think, you know, the trauma that it had put on me has lasted a long time. Now, at 10 years old, when you see your father make 50000 and give you twenty, did you have the wherewithal to know? You should be getting a lot more than that for your day's work. <laughs> I mean, I mean, now you know. I look back though. You know, I look back now and I say, "Wow, you know, this how, that's how he felt about me." You know, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know what type of state of mind he was in, but you know, it does, definitely don't justify the means. You know, don't get and, it twisted. Twenty dollars back then was a lot of money. I, I mean, you talking about nineteen eighty? Fifty thousand. You think about the fifty thousand? You got right. twenty dollars as a kid. You playing arcade games? Arcade games, exactly. Day long. You know, arcade yeah. games. Mad nowadays. You know, penny candy. You know, yes. stuff like that. You know, uh, wings and fries. So you know, for me, like you said, twenty dollars was a lot of money. But when I look back on it now, I'm like, wow. That's how he felt. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. You know. What about your mom? So my mom was addicted to drugs. Um, in 1980, 1980 seemed like a, a very cynical year for me. You know, my mom was addicted to drugs. Um, my stepdad went to prison, and everything just started falling apart. You know, there was no leadership in the household or no guidance. You know, and back then the community would kind of raise you, you know, and, and give you right or wrong information. So you had to accept it and, you know, use what you could. And um, she struggled, you know, for the most of my my juvenile or uh, adolescent life on drugs until she ended up dying from AIDS, you know. And, Damn. Um, it was tough because, I mean, my mom was my best friend. She was like the hero. She wasn't no cop. Always. She was going to do everything she could do to make sure me and my sister was okay, you know. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, you know, she fell victim to a disease that was greater than what she thought she could fight, you know. And unfortunately, in 1999, she died while I was in prison, you know. And it's so funny because I remember on the phone talking to her and I'm facing life in prison, you know. And, and you know, back then, you, you know, you can't cry in jail. You can't get on the phone and start crying. Guys, like, what's wrong? You know, I got sinus. You know what I'm saying? So, I remember getting a call on the three way, and she, and she was in the hospital, and and I, I, I was telling her that I was gonna be okay. You know, and I didn't know exactly how much time I was gonna get. I knew I was facing, and uh, she was talking real, real weak and lethargic, like <sighs> she could not breathe. And I said, "Ma, if you give up, I give up." And she just yelled, "Never give up!" 
and the phone went dead, and she died the next day. Yeah. So that's been my mantra, never give up, you know, since the entire time I've been home since 2010, you know. Um, started a publishing company, I wrote six books based on never give up philosophy, you know. As you know, my brother Emery, we come up with ways to pretty much promote positivity using these, you know, these mantras in the community. So that was one of the first things I did when I came home was start using never give up. Salute to Emery. Right, Baltimore's finest. Nope. You, you nope. are a marketing executive for uh, Shoe City, right? Shoe City, and, and you partnered with Rock Nation, right? Yeah, we had a, a, a management deal with my, one of my artists, Skies. Shout out to Skies, you know. Um, and they helped me, you know, learn the game. You know, me, I, I look up to Jay, Jay Brown, Tata. They've been brothers for a long time. And then mm -hmm. actually, two years ago, they helped me out with a marketing decision, a management decision, you know, and we partnered with one of my artists. So that's been one of the best experiences I had in my business life because. When you follow winners, you know, sometimes people want to be just like somebody, mm -hmm. but I want to create my own lane, you know, and try to use that blueprint to bridge the divide in Baltimore. You know, Baltimore don't really have too many leaders that are positive to come from where I come from, you know, and hopefully I can be that change that they want to see, not only on the business side, but I mean, just in politics. People always say, well, why would you sacrifice making millions of dollars to do that? Because my city dying, you know, and it's personal to me. You know, I can go to L.A. and and never come back, but I can't. I won't be happy, you know. I won't be at peace with myself, you know. And I don't know if Jay said it or Emory said it, but when I told him I was running for mayor, they're like, "Well, you can come out here, L.A. with us, and not be at peace, you know. You can leave Baltimore and be miserable. Or you can go back and leave Baltimore." And I said, "Well, why not, you know?" And there's a lot of people that support me. Unfortunately, you got people, man, who don't believe that you know anything is possible. You know, they didn't think Obama was gonna be president, you know. And now we have it. So I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful. I got a great team. Again, Shoe City has been, you know, a pioneer in the community. They helped me, you know, in ways I can't even explain, you know, in terms of taking care of my family, you know, and my marketing, my management, my consulting company doing real well. What's but, the first thing you want to change in Baltimore? What's the first thing you want to do that you see is, is bad or corrupt? Or I mean, we got we to gotta deal with the crime. I mean, in terms of, you know, making sure we're saving lives. A lot of, you know, in the last five years, we lost like 1,900-something lives total, 300 murders every year for the last five years. You know, you got to cure the corruption. You know, you got to have leaders that can manage and managers that can lead. But more importantly, you got to give kids hope. Right now they desensitize and they're hopeless and they don't see a need to change. And they run around here every day killing each other like it's art, you know. And that that bothers me because some of these kids look up to me and I got a relationship and a rapport with them. So I always say, if you know better, you do better. But I want to change the culture, bring love and unity back to Baltimore, inspire kids. They can be more... I mean, with all type of programs, you know, that are putting them in a position to succeed and be successful. You know, and start with education too. You know, we gotta bring vocational training back to our schools, mm -hmm. where ninth grade kids can be even engineers or plumbing, because that college ain't for everybody. You know, but 54 percent of the students in Baltimore that graduate, um, and you got 46 percent that don't graduate. Right. So we try to find a way to, you know, bridge that divide and give kids hope. You know, I was trying to, I was talking to, um, shout out to Mark Whitney. He's been a wonderful <clears> boy, and he. Uh, he does real estate seminars and does real estate down there. And we did a bunch of seminars down there where we were trying to teach uh, the people of, of Baltimore, Maryland, how right. to invest in real estate. You know, because at one time, Baltimore real estate was very, very inexpensive. Right. $1,000 for a house. Yeah, I know? bought a house for $5,000 $5, and sold it for. But a lot of times people don't <laughs> for know. For like one thirty five, like okay. you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, talk it's about the profit margins, man. Yeah, I have to. <laughs> I mean, but you don't be probably remember me and you and Mark did a uh, yeah, something yeah, in the book yeah, we got, you know. But I was right. saying, now, how do we teach people more how to do that? Because I, I think if people see the numbers, because you know, the first thing people think is I can't do that. I, there's no way I can afford it. They don't know how to do it, and that's what we try to teach people how to do things other than your normal type of job, how to be an entrepreneur. Because I mean. Right now is, is the white man is buying up all the Baltimore and then you're gonna look, they're gonna push us out and then charge us yeah. triple the rent to get back. Yeah, gentrification is real, you know, and again, shout out to Mark. You know, Mark has been right influential in the real estate market. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of it, you know, envy is education and relationships. You know, Mark, we talked the other day about trying to do a seminar to, you know, give people on the streets an opportunity to invest in some of these properties or these houses. And most of them want to do it, but a lot of people are scared, you know. Again, I was reading his book, a chapter of his book, I think it said sometimes uh, it's fear of, you know, it's having these phobias and these fears, you know. Um, and one in particular uh, chapter in the book, it was... Uh, Which book? Your, your Roots. Um, oh, yeah. Black Privilege? Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, you Which know. book? Yeah, you I mean, know. I've got a couple of New York Times bestsellers. <laughs> okay, okay. That's nothing. Okay, but, you know, when he's talking about your roots... Fine. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, yeah. A, and a lot of people don't understand the difference between the two, the old you and the new you, right? right? You know, and I think right now when you find people like Mark who has information... You know, that's relevant or prevalent to a successful real estate plan, you need to try to find ways to get involved and engage, you know. And there's a lot of guys in Baltimore who will, will invest in real estate. They don't know how. So right. 
again, Mark is starting a, a trend where people can follow him and see how it works, you know, and he's been successful so far. So I think that's the start, finding people like Mark who know what they're doing you can trust. Because, you know, like now, it's Scam City all over the country, scam you know. Scam City. You know, and like, you know, a lot of people f- find it hard to follow people like that, mm-hmm. especially when it's involved money. You know, right. somebody say, I'm going to give you $50,000. You know, like, nah, that's a scam. Mm-hmm. You no, know, but it's really not. Man, Mark gave a, a, a lot of free houses away before to people who joined programs. So Absolutely. I definitely think it's a start with guys like Mark. So what are the other ways to bring money back to the hood? Because, you know, that's the only thing that's going to decrease the crime rate. You know what I'm saying? I agree with you when you talk about, you know, making people love themselves, but you definitely got to bring money or economic, to the hood. You know, I mean, I'm always about economic development, you know, mm-hmm. especially in the urban communities. You know, we got to see cranes in the city, mm-hmm. you know, and people that look like us investing in us and doing things like that. So I have a lot of ideas, a plethora of ideas in terms of, you know, creating a new economy. You know, we got to solarize Baltimore and find ways to, you know, uh, even though I know everybody think artificial intelligence is going to replace jobs, but we got to be a 21st century city. Mm-hmm. And our infrastructure is poor, you know, our transit system is poor. But in order to bring money, you got to have new ideas and relationships outside of Baltimore. And I mean, I have quite a few, you know. We can have a rolling loud come to Baltimore, you know, yeah. you know, Art Basel, some things that our culture can adopt and adapt Isn't the to. Isn't the CIAA coming to Baltimore? That, that's coming to Baltimore mm-hmm. um, next, year, yeah. next year. You know, again, we got two. Took it from Charlotte, man. I'll bid Charlotte. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if if it's a good thing. Oh, it's a great thing for Baltimore. What I'm saying, but again, Is Baltimore ready for that with with the amount of people and hotels and. I, I think I think I think we we Baltimore is, is the city envy that I think man you know is. For some reason, I heard y'all talking about tank this money, right? You know, we, we find a way, man, to get ready at the last minute for anything. Like, even we had, <laughs> even we had the crisis. I mean, like, you know, we did. I mean, <laughs> we do because, like, Baltimore is, is made different. Like, you know, we don't pretty much manufacture or distribute anything in terms of corporate America, but we got two Fortune 500 companies in Baltimore under our material price. But we find a way to get around, you know, all the deficits and make a way. Unfortunately, right now, we on, on, we in a deficit in terms of crime, but... You know, we got two historical colleges, you know, Cobb and, you know, and Morgan. We can find ways to use those institutions to build relationships with basketball programs all over the country. Mm-hmm. But you got to have relationships, you know. And a lot of those nostalgic thinking people in the office, they don't understand the importance of basketball, mm-hmm. you know, or black basketball, you know, and giving these kids hope. Nowadays, kids, you know, shout out to my guy Meek, they want to be like Meek before they want to be like LeBron because it's almost like instant gratification. You see somebody with, uh, you know, a Rolls Royce and a nice chain of watch, and they got that off a of beat, you know, in a mixtape, you like, well, that's 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 what I want to do. Opposed to going to college for four years or you know becoming it's a still doctor. Not easy though. Like, well, me, me, no, no, me I know, I know. I mean, my time. son and again, our, our, the guys I manage is not easy. But your son the, is YBS scholar, right? Scholar, scholar. Yeah, yeah, you know, from the looks of it on Instagram, you're like, oh, yeah. I, it's easy, you know, because you don't see the hardships that guys go through, you know, to stay consistent in the music business. You know, it's, things change. Everything viral and digital Absolutely. now, you know, so it's difficult for well, some guys. And we don't really look at uh, you know what Meek does. For the gifted actually is right. like he's a he's a gifted individual. God yes. blessed him with a a, 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 a certain Meek amount of talent. Gifted, right. You know, we see LeBron. He's like, oh, he's six nine. He's right. physically genetically right. different than anything we ever seen. Like that. That's what we look at as a gift. But no, right. Meek got a gift too. Now Meek is very gifted and talented, and Meek motivate a lot of kids that want to be just like him, just like LeBron. But I'm saying in the inner city of Baltimore, when you've been deprived of opportunities, you look for the fast exchange. Like, what can I do that's fast and convenient to make it out of here? Because right. I want to get out now. I don't want to wait 8, 10, 12 years. You know, I want to get out here now. And I think some of the guys in Baltimore, I mean, you think about it. Like, my son, he is a rapper. But Baltimore don't really have too many popular known rappers. Like, for some reason, we've been ignored and denied that platform. Like, you look at Atlanta, you look at New York, you look mm-hmm. at my L.A., they got a plethora of artists, you know, and for some reason, you know, we, we want to change that too. You know, give everybody a chance to have a platform where though their talent can be seen and noticed, and then you know, we can start multiplying that success and create some hope. Cause I, one thing about Baltimore, if you give us hope, like the Ravens, you give us hope, man. You know, you, you know, you can call a cab. You know, and we're gonna ride until you know, till it's gone. Like you know, we have a lot of young talent in Baltimore right now. Like I heard y'all was talking about Javante. You know, I mean, we had a, a wonderful relationship. You know, but I think. We have a lot more Javantes in Baltimore if given the opportunity to get that platform. You got DJ Quicksilver out there. That's right? my guy, Quick. Shout out to Quick. Quick Just hilarious. Just, Just hilarious out there. Is Shot Glizzy from Baltimore or DC? DC. DC. Shot for DC. Mm-hmm. What, what exactly is the Stokey Project? Uh, Stokey Project is a marketing management consultant firm where, you know, I help develop careers such as Lower Skies, you know, um, manage kids like Mano, Platinum Recording, I mean, Platinum Producer out of Chicago. Um, a, lot, a lot of community activism, you know that I involve my company in, you know, and just a homegrown company that's really trying to expand beyond, you know, the shores of Baltimore to give people a chance to use my relationships and certain industry platforms to succeed. What's, what's your the people's plan? 
or the people playing is you no. Know, again, you got people in Baltimore when they talk about politics, they always talk about how to help the wrong people, whether it be developers, people that already have wealth. Well, my people plan is a plan that we created to help the people. You know, when we talk about education, what does that look like? When we talk about affordable housing, what does that look like? You know, and you know, bridging is the divide between, as you said earlier, you know, what what is wealth? You know, to some of us, you know, a lot of people in Baltimore in the two one two one seven, the average household income is like twenty something thousand dollars. You know, and we talking about two thousand twenty, inflation don't stop. You know, so why should we stop getting more paying good paying jobs? So. The people plan is, you know, it's lengthy, but it directly attacks the ills that Baltimore faces in terms of our political paradigm or establishment and finding ways to change that. So, what about the prison system, since I'm sure you have had that firsthand experience? So what do you have to say about that and relationships with the police? Um, well, the prison system in Baltimore, um, you know, and, and reform in this entirety, you know, is, has been unfair as long as I can remember. You know, um, I think they have a lot of movements right now that's prevalent to reform and changing things. You know, I think Jay-Z and Meek and a few other people have reform movements going on. Um, I think in terms of the police in Baltimore, we have a lot of improprieties, a lot of unconstitutional arrests. You know, there, there has been issues with the police department in Baltimore for a long time. You know, again, those systematic failures to me come from lack of leadership. When you get the right leadership, you know, and someone who can manage these institutions inside of government, you're going to see change. And sometimes people get so comfortable and content with doing things the same way, they don't see need to change. And somebody identify a flaw, like, hold up, y'all been doing that for how long? Or somebody from the outside come in, like, you know, when Donald Trump made a statement about Baltimore, it, it, it was some of that stuff was true, but I didn't want to hear from him if he ain't going to change the conditions. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you the you know? president. Help yeah, me out. Help me out, exactly. Yeah. You know, they throw me a life. There's some federal aid down here. Yeah, I mean, we all, we talking about Ukraine. I mean, I got 300 dead bodies with people, you know, that, that got names in Baltimore that we can save if we get more resources, you That's know? That's real. So I'm like, help us out, you know? I mean, and then again, like, you got people who just don't know how it works. I mean, again, there's sections in Baltimore that's not problematic, you know? I mean, that's known for being successful, but we don't have problems in those areas. So you got people who are trying to fix things that they don't know how it works. The inner city of Baltimore, I mean, that's where I'm from, you know? I can identify with these kids all day long. You speak about prison, most of these individuals, you know, repeat or increase the recidivism because of they hopeless. They think that they're black, they got a record, there's no job with their name on it, right? So they, they give up. But when they see someone like myself who come home, the Emory's of the world, come home and find ways to make, now Emory's an exception, you know, because, you know, he, he got a, you know, a, a golden, you know, dragon in his corner, but some of us who don't have that, we get we become so hopeless and so desensitized, we're like, man, that ain't for me, I ain't gonna make it, you know? But even even with that golden dragon, man, you still have to have something in you that, that allows you to be able to take advantage of that Absolutely. opportunity that may be provided. Yeah, I, I agree with that premise. I'm saying for me, like, you know, being in Baltimore, people always assume that my relationships is, is the reason why, you know, I'm successful. But I changed my thinking. And right now, you know, people get mad for you trying to help your city. And that kind of bothers me. Like, you know, I'm human. Like, you know, at the end of the day, I take the good with the bad. But, like, I never really understood why people get mad if you want to help. Yeah. Now, you, you know, like... They don't know. They, they A lot of people don't feel that the help is genuine for whatever reason. No, they that, think you're doing it for your own personal selfish. Yeah, but look at, I mean, do your research, look at my record. Like, mm -hmm. I have never done that. I, I mean, I'm a selfless individual. Like, I never gave back because I wanted somebody to give me a like on Instagram or give me a certificate, you mm -hmm. know, or anything like that. And I don't partner with people who do or feel that way. I mean, I'm from Baltimore, you know, born and raised. So, and I'm not speaking in terms of the people that I know. It's other people. I did an interview yesterday um, for one of the local newspapers, and I was explaining to him, man, that it's difficult, really, to change y'all mind. Y'all been thinking that way for 50 years, right? So I understand some of y'all don't believe that people change, you know? I mean, we have people that slept in the White House to smoke marijuana. They don't mean they're a junkie, right? right. You, you make mistakes. Absolutely. Like, but it's also a way to turn around and, and, and right in your wrongs and lead not only your family but yourself in the right direction, you know? And I look forward to it, but more importantly, when you think about these kids that don't have fathers, mm -hmm. or kids, moms who use drugs who are not there, who are the ones that's going to tell them or help them get back on the right track? And that's what's missing in Baltimore. That's a very big element, you know, that's missing in Baltimore. These kids don't have too many people they can relate to, you know. And I hope I'm praying that I'm be, I can be that change. And again, 80 percent of the reason why I got in this wasn't to be a politician. It was to create a platform of hope and give young guys an understanding and a vision that you can still change your life. You know, I took a 12-year hiatus, you know, away from my kids, you know, couldn't play, you know, instruments. I couldn't do anything, you know, couldn't go to the park, you know, and it affected my kids, you know, and to this day, some of that 
causes generational curses, you know? Mm -hmm. So now I want to do what I can do to make sure someone else's son don't go through what my son going through. Were you and Emery locked up together? Yeah. yeah. Y'all were? Okay. yeah that's how I met Emery. I met Emery, you know, um, in 1998, you know, in the cell, you know? Wow. And when he came in, you know, I had a big case in Baltimore, you know, mm -hmm. and they try to get people to tell on me. And, and you know, and back then, you know, you was very, very um, suspicious of anybody, you know, especially Sellies, you know. And when Henry came in, he had his glasses on, you know, and, you know, he was very humble. And, and I had to sell to myself for, like, probably three months. I told him I didn't want no Sellie, you know, because I had phobias that somebody was coming there trying to fabricate some information. So mm -hmm. I moved my stuff off the top of my bunk so Henry could get up there, you know. And, and every day I would, you know, jump out, open the, uh, the cage and, Jump on the phone and everybody like, yo, let me get the phone. And he was just real humble. I never knew he was Jay Z co defendant. I never knew he never spoke about it. But one day, uh, you know, I think Jay Z might have been in Baltimore doing a radio interview. Like, shout out to my man, Henry on T section. And I'm like, that's you? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but Henry never said anything, you know. And then that's when Rock Wear clothing line had just came out. And we had a special. Like, man, I ain't wearing that. I ain't going nowhere. Let me get it. I'm going to visit. And we established a very strong bond, and to this day, that's my brother, you know. Mm -hmm. He let me have his share his mom with me, you know, his kids with me, you know, and same over here, you know, and we have always supported each other, you know, again, making calls to people like you, man, because he know exactly where my heart is, you know, and I love him for that, you know. He's one of the most genuine, you know, heartfelt guys I've ever met in my life. Great brother. You know? And I, I mean, I don't know what I would do without him sometime because he one of the guys, I'm older than him by a few years, but he always check me if he see I'm saying something that's out mm -hmm. of pocket or doing something because he wants me to win, you know? And it's guys like Jay Brown that's in my life because of Emory, you know, Jay-Z's the Tatas, those guys who've been supporting me, you know, for the longest time, you know, trying to make sure that I understand exactly what this new era of my life looks like. How long y'all been together? Um, well, I did 12, Emory did 12, but you know, okay. when you get sentenced and then you get designated, you go separate ways. So they gotcha. sent me to Jersey and sent me to Pennsylvania, but we will always communicate. Now you said on Fox 45 News, you were talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, you are talking about uh, over-policing, but also implementing more police in high crime areas. So no. How, how do you balance that? Well, right? no, I was saying in 2005, okay. Baltimore locked up 105, 8,000 people. So I mean, that's over-policing because you're talking about mass incarceration all over again. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying in Baltimore, where there's high crime, you have to find police presence, you know. And we have something in Baltimore called the consent decree, where now the police are being monitored by how they police because of a lot of unconstitutional arrests, improprieties, and illegal activities from the police. So um, what I know will be the answer is, first of all, you got to have police relationships. Like, you got to bring not officer friendly back to a point where though a thug slapping upside his head, because we kind of had that, but you can't be always aggressive because... Mm -hmm. That really, you know, bridges the vibe. But we gotta have quality trained police who understand hopefully lives where we where they work. Because if you come from Connecticut or you come from certain parts of Baltimore, you don't understand what these young men go through. So if somebody standing on the corner with their hands in their pocket, you might think they got a gun, but they just that's a hand warmer for some guys in the in the, in the city. Put their hands down their pants because they cold. Mm -hmm. But you gotta have more police to understand exactly what the culture uh, um, consists of and be relatable. So right. what I would right. like to see is, you know, more trained respectful police in areas where there's high crime and not just in places where they're protecting buildings. You got more police protecting the inner harbor than you got protecting lives in the inner city. And that's problematic, you know? And I understand why, because that's the face of the city. But we're losing lives in the inner city, you know? And the other day, they actually had police on the corner running squeegee kids off the corner, right? I'm saying now, when you run them off the corner, where do you think they're going to go to? All right. They're going to go back to somewhere, a trap or something, and find some type of probably a legal means to survive because that's that a legal reason. hustle, right? The squeegee's a legal yeah, hustle. Well, yeah, well, they, they call it panhandling. They call it's, it panhandling. Yeah, panhandling. Yeah. But the thing about it is, though, it's like a, it, 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 you look at certain individuals, whether it be white guys out there with signs saying I'm working for food, and then you got four or five kids with a squeezing in their hand, right? So they run in one group off the corner and one, one is allowed to stay. Right. But what's the difference? If they both bagging, you know, why are we choosing, oh, the young kids are more aggressive, they violent, they disrespectful. They black. Know? And they black, right? You know what I'm saying? And we got people who's running for office talking about taking their squeezy from them, you know, running them here, running them there. Well, I'm okay with you going to run them somewhere, but run them to something. No, 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 so no. I got programs or ideas about creating incubators in the inner city. We got 17,000 vacant houses in Baltimore. We can create 24 houses, two in each district, right? and turn them into incubators or community hubs and give these kids the opportunity to invest in music, they can invest in engineering, if they're in school they can't work until after four o'clock, you know, you can give them something to do. You can have recreation, education, and job readiness in the same building. 
Right. And grandma come in there with that culinary art to teach people how to cook. Have little small uh, music booths. Those kids invest in music. 87.4% of 1,525 people that was murdered in Baltimore was in the music. They mm. had it in their bio or their obituary. But there's no major music programs in Baltimore. So now these kids sit around here and do things that hopefully become an artist, but they don't have nobody who can accept their talent. Mm. Well, we appreciate you for joining us. Yeah. Tell people and how they can get yeah, in contact with you. How can they help? Well, campaign. first of all, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, they always say it's, it's about money, but to me it's, it's really about leadership, man, and, and help change these people's thinking. You know, we have a, a volunteer... Uh, core of people, man, that's been showing up on Mondays at 6.30 at my headquarters in Baltimore, 23 East North Avenue. My website is stokeyforbemore.com. On social network is stokeyforbemore. I mean, on Instagram, stokeyforbemore. And my personal page is the Stokey Project. But I just need people to really wake up, man, understand that if we do this the right way, we can change a lot of inner cities in Baltimore. I mean, in, in the country. Because there are a lot of guys that come off from prison or want to change their life, who don't want to increase the recidivism. They want another chance, and they want to be a part of the solution, not the problem. But we don't come together and support each other because we keep saying they ain't going to let us. Well, in Baltimore, we 65% of the population. Right. So they is us, right. right? So we wake up and say, you know what, we're going to find ways to get behind someone who we trust, relate, and respect. A lot of people will start changing their, their viewpoints, you know, even our own. So I'm just optimistic, man. First of all, I want to thank y'all for giving me this opportunity. I'm a big fan of the show. Thank you, Again, King. yours, you know, and, and what y'all stand for. And, and, and platform like this is not really you know, available in my town. So I had to come over to New York to get, you know, some support. So these opportunities help me out. So I'm blessed to be here, you know, and uh, I appreciate it, man. What's the website? You said oh, Stokey? The, the, the website is stokeyforbemore.com. Right. What's your campaign slogan? You got one? Um, well, I, I have a few, you know. You know, I am change is the one I really like the most because I am change. What about I am change for you? The we the people, we got, you know, we the people, I am change. You he know what I'm saying? You. He like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I am change. Oh, no, because, oh, yeah. You. He get it. He that Y-E with a bunch of W's. Yeah, they say two and two. you. You yeah. know what I'm saying? No. Yes, man. Yes. <laughs> All yes. right. Well, it's Carl Michael Stokey Kennedy. We appreciate you for joining us. Thank you for having me, man. It's I appreciate the Breakfast you, Club. Man. Good morning.